I am Todd Mancini. I am the uh, lead product manager for OpenShift.io. I'm joined in the room by many of the folks that have worked on OpenShift.io. So if you love what you see, you know, give them a hug. If you if you if you don't like what you see, you know, blame me, I guess. Um, but let's go into this right away. I want to waste no time, and let's really figure out what is OpenShift.io. You've come here to to learn more about it. And, the, the fir and I want to just make sure my presentation mode doesn't have any funny bars on it. There we go. So the first question I'll ask is, who here already has an account on OpenShift.io? So good. A fair number of hands, although many of you should have an account given that you built it. So great. So the, the, what's great about that is you are already a part of our community. The mere act of you using the product helps us make it better, but your feedback even makes it that much stronger. So, so thank you for, for using OpenShift.io and giving it a try. For those of you who haven't used it and are like, okay, what is this OpenShift.io all about? Well, I'll just make it really fast and simple. It's about making applications that you can deploy on OpenShift. As you saw in the keynote this morning, there's tremendous power in making these applications for OpenShift because they become instantly portable across hybrid cloud. And we want to really make it easy for people to be able to develop applications for OpenShift. But we didn't want to just focus on the developer. We wanted to focus on the end-to-end -end development lifecycle, from ideation to planning, to the coding and testing and design work and how you deploy it out and how do you monitor it after it's been run. And so you're going to see all of that today, hopefully. And everything that I'm going to show you today is available for free if you go sign up for OpenShift.io. So I encourage you to do so uh, as soon as we're done. Now, the grand vision of OpenShift.io is so you can build any kind of application on OpenShift and not merely make a containerized application that, that runs on OpenShift, but one that really starts to exploit OpenShift. And we want you to be able to do that in the language of your choice, using the runtime of your choice, but kind of in a crawl, walk, run mode. You know, we had to start someplace, and we wanted to really play to our strengths. So today, OpenShift.io is really about building open source Java-based applications using some very popular Java frameworks. And when doing that, you're going to get the kind of the full first class experience inside of OpenShift.io and all of its capabilities. Um, now, if you want to not use Java, or maybe you don't want to do open source, you want to do something that's public, you want to maybe do a little, little private coding, um, you know, we store all of your source code when you use OpenShift.io on, on GitHub. Maybe you want to store it someplace else, so on and so forth. If you want to know more about uh, the future of OpenShift.io, we have a session tomorrow at 4.30 that will be a roadmap session looking beyond today. I encourage you to, to join us about that. So OpenShift.io, it's really about helping you to get started quickly. It really is about you getting an app into the public cloud on OpenShift as quickly as possible. And I'm not thinking hours, you know, I'm talking minutes, seconds, you know, if you really, if you really can type fast. Um, your app will be running in the public cloud. Um, OpenShift.io is going to help you make decisions with confidence, and we'll, we'll see what that means. And not only will you be building apps that are running in OpenShift, that are containerized, but you're going to be able to leverage all of the capabilities of OpenShift, and you're going to be able to do that even if you have no idea how to do that. And I'm living proof of that. I really do not know OpenShift APIs. I don't necessarily know how to build a microservice the right way. I don't necessarily know how to do Docker commands to create containers. But yet, I am highly successful at OpenShift.io because it really does a lot of magic for you to make that super simple. And then the last thing I'll tell you is that what I love about OpenShift.io, it is real open source. If you want to go look at the source code for OpenShift.io, go look at it. It's on GitHub. If you want to fork it and change it and run your own version, go ahead. And we partner with a lot of communities. So OpenShift.io brings together Jenkins and, and Eclipse Che and a lot of the runtimes we use, like uh, Eclipse Vertex. And then there's the, the actual kind of core unified user experience of, of OpenShift.io itself. These are tremendous communities. I'm extremely proud of the team at Red Hat that has worked on this, uh, consummate professionals who have put together, I think, a phenomenal service, and hopefully you will feel the same way. But I have to prove it to you first. You're not going to just believe those bold claims that I'm making. But before I can prove it to you, you have to make a decision. You have to decide if you're going to take the red pill or the blue pill. Now, if you choose the blue pill, I guarantee you a presentation that will be flawless. 
I will go through 167 slides, and they're beautiful, and there's nice screenshots, and it can't possibly fail, because it's a fantasy world. But if you choose the red pill, I will throw away these slides, I will dive into the product, and we will spend the next 41 minutes going full demo, full live, where anything could happen. So who would like the safe blue pill? Hmm, not Matt and May. How about the red pill? Who wants the red? Oh, okay. Great, because I actually didn't make any slides, so that's good. Uh, because we are doing a live demo, um, legal has required me to put up a disclaimer, so I will give you a chance to read that. Great, okay, you've had your chance to read the disclaimer. By you staying in the room, you have now um, legally agreed to the liability of watching this live demo. So with that, end of slides, and let's get over to the big demo. So as I said, you can sign up for OpenShift.io simply by going to OpenShift.io, and you just click on the big sign up button there. In the process of doing that, you'll also become a member of the Red Hat Developer Program and get all the nice advantages of being a member of our program. Um, but once again, everything's free, doesn't cost you anything, um, and we, we hope you enjoy that. All right, so here I am. I'm already um, logged into uh, OpenShift.io, and uh, when I first log in, I see this kind of dashboard of things that are relevant to me. These are things I'm working on, things for me to act upon. We'll get into these in a moment. You don't have to worry about them. But the, uh, the most important thing is that you've got to understand a core concept in OpenShift.io, and that's of a space. So a space is a place where a team comes together to work. So if we're going to start working on a project together, we would make a new space for that. So if I come here and I go and create a new space, a wizard pops up that is going to let me create, um, create a space. You know, it's dawning on me that I'm kind of doing the exact same demo I, I did last year. And, and I don't like that. The, um, I, I'm supposed to entertain you people, and, and, and I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. And that, of course, was a dramatic version of the scene from the movie Eddie and the Cruisers. I hope you enjoyed that. No, so let's go ahead. And I freaked some people out in this room, which was a lot of fun. That's why I did that. Uh, so let me do this. The, let me tell you something about how we develop OpenShift.io before I create this space, because it's highly relevant to this. The UI you see there is not necessarily the most attractive thing on Earth, because this UI was highly designed by people with great talent, like me, a product manager who knows nothing about design, and various engineers who were just trying to hurriedly implement OpenShift.io as we worked on it. Um, eventually, we were able to get our, the UX design team involved at Red Hat. Um, I believe um, vomit in my mouth was a phrase they used when they, when they saw parts of it. But they, they then said, all right, we're going to help you guys make this thing look better. Now, the way they do that is we worked closely with them. And in OpenShift.io, we adopt a model of um, continuous delivery. So we are constantly pushing updates out to OpenShift.io in production every day, multiple times a day. One could be happening now. Matter of fact, they threatened to upgrade the cluster on me while I was sitting here. So they're giving the thumbs up. They're probably upgrading it now with their open laptop. So it's fun. Um, but so because we do continuous delivery, there is a danger you could break something. So one of the ways we can achieve doing that kind of continuous delivery model is to do testing in production, but mitigating the, the impact of that by using feature flags. So every new feature that gets deployed out to OpenShift.io gets bound behind a feature flag. I have gone to my settings, and you can do the same in your account, and you'll see I'm seeing the production-only features. These are the features that have been released that we haven't fully signed off on. But if I wanted to, I could go down to the beta feature level. So beta features are kind of what they, they say they are. These are features that are um, kind of, we think, in a pretty good state, but they do need some more testing. We're looking for feedback on them. But these are features that are going to be a part of the product. Um, they will eventually graduate to that production level. Now, if you go down one more step, there are experimental features. Experimental features are ones where we're just toying around with some new ideas, some new concepts. These could be anything from features that, that, that do something we're guessing might be worth doing. They, they could actually be just mock-up, like just some UI mock-up that we're just seeing how does that render on screen? What does that look and feel like? 
So you could go down the experimental level. If you really want to see some experimental features, come to the session tomorrow for the roadmap session, and we'll deep, uh, dive a little bit deeper on those. And then lastly, because I'm a Red Hat employee, I have access to these internal features. We actually don't use this feature hardly ever. This is really used only when we have embargoed changes. Maybe we have a non, an undisclosed vulnerability, and we need to change some UI. And if we made that UI change available for people to see, that might disclose the vulnerability. So that lets us do the final test in production on those undisclosed things um, uh, on live in production. Quick question? They are cumulative. A that's a great question. So yes, if you are down at internal, you see everything above, and so on and so forth. So yes. So I'm switching to beta. And now let me go back to the account home. And just to be sure, I'll do a, a quick uh, refresh on my browser. And let me go ahead and let that load over the conference Wi-Fi. And now when I go create a space, I've got a new, much more stylized, much more actionable user experience. So I'm, I'll stay in beta for now. But what's kind of cool about this, this user experience is um, it, I think it actually uh, looks pretty slick. And we've actually had it uh, running for a while. We've, we've done, I think, enough testing on it. So I am, I am going to do the ultimate red pill. And I'm pretty sure you have never seen anyone dumb enough to do this on stage. I am going to go into the system which controls which features are production and not. And I'm going to take this feature for the new UI, and I am going to go ahead and release it, and that is going to scare the heck out of some people in this room, but I've just done it. So now that feature is now live, not even beta anymore. So if you go in and you go make a new space and you don't change to the beta level, you will get this new experience. It is now live in production. You are all part of that, so thanks. All right, so, so I gotta go make my new space. So there's a place where we're gonna collaborate together, me and, and a team. And so I, I need to basically tell it two things. One is uh, the name of the space. So I'll just call it, you know, Summit 2018. Uh, I can give it a description. Uh, but the other thing I need to do is I need to kind of say, all right, how are we going to collaborate together? And this is through a, a process template or a space template, we call them. And uh, here I can choose from two different development methodologies, one being Scrum and the other one being Scenario driven development. Eventually there'll be others here. These are the first two that are available right now. I think people understand what Scrum is or are familiar with Scrum. Um, I'm going to choose scenario dri driven development um, and we'll have a chance to talk more about that as, as we uh, get into this. So I click OK and with that I now have a space created. That's how quick it is. A space is now ready to go. But a space with nothing in it is kind of boring. So OpenShift.io wants you to be able to get started quickly. So the wizard kind of continues, and I, can, I could X out of this if I wanted to and just jump in my space, or I can use this wizard to actually create an application. So I give it a name. I'll, I'll just keep the default there of app test one. And then I've can, I can build my new application one of two ways. I can either create a new code base, so I'm going to just kind of start coding with the help of a wizard, or I could import some existing code like that I have on, on GitHub. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and create a new app. Why not? Let me hit continue. And now a, the wizard pops up and says, all right, let's go build this app, Todd. How are we going to put it together? And it starts off by asking me two questions. What mission are you going to follow, and what runtime are you going to use for that? So let me explain these concepts. So missions describe the kind of app you're building. Maybe you're building a database updating app, so like a CRUD app. Or maybe you want to exploit some of the features of OpenShift whereby you want to be able to have configuration parameters of your application that when it's deployed in OpenShift, an OpenShift operations person can in real time adjust those configuration parameters of your application. Or maybe you want an app that when it's deployed out in a pod in OpenShift, if it crashes, it'll automatically restart itself and do those kind of health checks, so on and so forth. Today, we have uh, a few missions. There's a much larger catalog of missions that are available um, uh, that we are just in the process of kind of certifying them to work in OpenShift.io itself. So you'll see this list actually change on almost a daily basis. Now, when you use, so I'll just choose, say, externalized configuration for now. But now, you know, what your app does has, says nothing about how it's written and what languages and frameworks and runtimes you've used, right? So with that, once I've picked my mission, I can now choose a runtime. 
So for example, I might want to use the uh, Eclipse Vertex runtime, which is a reactive framework, and I've been using it a lot lately, and, and I, I really like Vertex. But if I preferred to make a Spring Boot type app, I could do that. And you know, the wizard will do the right thing of combining these uh, capabilities together. Um, now, OpenShift.io is not just about helping the developer code. That's what that kind of first part was. Um, I've created what we call a booster that's giving me my mission and my runtime. But we really want developers and development teams to adopt best practices, especially when using OpenShift. And a big part of adopting some best practices is around using really complex um, development pipelines that ensure you're doing continuous integration, that you're doing continuous deployment, that you're doing rolling deployments. When you, so when you put your new application out into production, you cleanly shut the old version down, migrate all the users off of it, and slowly move them onto the new version of that app without anybody like dropping a beat. Like you don't want it, your app to appear to have gone offline at all. So to do that, you really want to make use of some really nice build pipelines. These can be really hard to write and get and, and produce correctly. But with OpenShift.io, it's just built in. I just accept the fact that I want this really nice complex one that builds it in my code, makes a, puts it in a Maven repo, we'll do a source to image build on it, produce an image, put that um, uh, uh, available to be then rolled out into pods in, in OpenShift. And including both a, a place to stage that for kind of user acceptance testing, gives me the ability to do a final approval and promotion on it, and, uh, and then finally roll it out to my kind of production run environment. Once again, I don't know how to do any of those things. It does. And then lastly, I need my code to live somewhere. So it's, it's got to write some code for me that I can use as the basis of my application. I will just put that in my GitHub repo. And lastly, it's like saying, like, here's all the choices you made. Do you want to do it? And I say yes. Now we are going to have to wait a little while for this thing to actually do all that work. There's a lot to be done there. Um, oh, it's done. So OK, we can move on. So now I can go in and view my application. So now I've got a space that I've created called Summit 2018. And there's a new app in it. And because it has created this new app, it's immediately starting to do a build on it. It's like, all right, let's get that app built and let's get it deployed out. Because the, the booster that I use, that mission and that runtime, did create a full, fully realized OpenShift compatible application. So it's like, let's go and get it out there and running. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to kill this build because we're going to have an ample opportunity a little bit later to see the, uh, the full impact of, of builds. So I'm just going to do some quick links that get me over into OpenShift itself, where the build is running. And I've now just canceled that build. And you can see the build has stopped. So the demonstration will be much more interesting if we can, in fact, go into a space where we don't just have some boilerplate code that we started with, but where we've actually done some work. So I've now switched over to a space called Sentiment Shift. And Sentiment Shift is, is an application or a series of applications and microservices that's all about monitoring the sentiment of a product or service as it's, as it's being represented in social media, right? So imagine you're a restaurant chain, and, you're, and there's some tweet that comes out about someone getting really sick at your restaurant, right? And that tweet starts going viral. Well, you want to know that that's happening as quickly as possible so you can potentially do some damage control, maybe even do something that will turn that person's negative experience into a positive one. So this is the application or sets of, of, of applications we're trying to, uh, to create. Now, to do that, we're going to start making use of a virtuous development cycle. Now, where I'm looking at now is a, a kind of a dashboard of, of this space and the work that's being done in it. Um, we'll come back to some of the details of this space. But basically, this is letting me analyze what's going on. What is the current state of the world? Right? Is, is my app running? Is it not? What is being said about it? You know, what kind of data can I pull in? And we're going to have a lot of different types of data that, that pull into the, this, this analyze tab. But that's part of the virtuous development cycle is you look at the world around you and you make some decisions about what to do next. You've got to come up with a plan. And that's why you would then move over to doing planning. So here you go in to make a plan about what to create. Right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to add these new features, and we'll, we'll get it deeper into the planner in a second. And then finally, once you've decided what to build, you go and build it, and then you create something. And creation includes the act of deploying it. And after you've deployed it, what do you do? You go monitor it, and you analyze it again. So you have this virtuous cycle that's never ending, where you're doing constant 
refinement and trying to always increase the value delivery of your application. It's really nicely encapsulated in the workflow of, of OpenShift.io. So I said I chose this uh, scenario-driven planning um, methodology. Uh, so like I said, most of you know Scrum, but you probably don't know scenario-driven planning. So let's just spend just a brief second talking about it, and there'll be a blog posting that goes into a lot more details of what scenario-driven planning is. But it starts with this notion that uh, a lot of software out there, w one of the key problems that we find is that people don't know how to make good backlogs. They just keep coming up with new features and more and more features. And oh, we had this feature, we got to do the next version of that feature, and you end up with this massive bloat. And it's not clear that you're actually solving any problems worth solving. So in scenario-driven planning, one of the most important aspects of it is to first identify key value scenarios. These are real-world problems that your customers are facing. And you just describe the problem. You do not describe the solution. These are things that you decide are worth addressing. So in the case of this uh, sentiment analyzer, this was this notion that, hey, something could happen socially that goes viral, and you want to be able to respond to it quickly. It doesn't say how you're going to respond to it quickly. It doesn't even tell you how it's, you're going to be informed that this has happened. It's just saying this is a real-world problem we're solving. If I then expand that, I can see there are a bunch of value propositions. So this, these are the values that a customer would realize where they're a solution to this problem. Things like they might mitigate damage of negative sentiment, amplify positive sentiment, change negative into a positive, so on and so forth. And what's great about this is you can identify several real-world scenarios of high value, and then via the various value propositions you've expressed for those, decide which is the highest value problem to go solve. This is how you avoid the entrapment of feature bloat. It is a really nice way of giving you focus into what is the highest value to be delivering for, to your customers. Once you've figured that out, you then think about, all right, how can we solve this problem? And you start authoring an experience. An experience is essentially like a demo script. It's like, if we were to solve this problem or part of this problem, what would that look like? And you want to do it in a language that you think would be the ideal way to solve that problem. Do not do it in the language of the way your product or service works today. Right? Because the way your product or service works today, it might be the most natural way to solve that problem is you do like these, you go through these 15 screens and click on nine things and yada, 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 and it's complicated. That's probably not the idealized solution. If you said, if we had a blank slate, what would it look like to solve this problem in the best possible way? And you might find, well, that would mean the experience would be, I would just need to fill out like these two pieces of information and click done, right? That's the other great thing about doing these experiences. It really helps you to really rethink outside of kind of the confines of how you've approached problems in the past. Things evolve. Your product needs to evolve. And the best way to do that is to think long and hard about um, these experiences. Now that I've got some experiences, then now development starts to look, I'd say, a bit more normal. Okay, then you decompose those down into a bunch of features. Think of these like you, may, you might do these as user stories. Um, those you're going to decompose into development tasks, so on and so forth. So you're kind of in a more of a your kind of traditional, agile, be it Scrum, Kanban, what have you. You know, do the model that makes sense to you. So without further ado, let's go and actually look at the current state of this application, because most of that work that was just described there has already been done. So if I go over to create, uh, the first thing, of course, is it, the source code's on GitHub. So you know, there it is. If I want to go play with it, I can just deal with it on GitHub. Feel for if you guys are quick and can memorize URLs, you can go look at it as well. It's all open. Um, but I'm going to go look at these deployments. So the deployments are showing me my, ap my application is now currently running in two different environments, a staging environment and a run environment. So that staging environment is where I do kind of my user acceptance testing. You'll see that version 41 is in my uh, staging environment. And in kind of my production environment or my run environment is version 39 right now. Now, the reason we call it run is very simple. Uh, we give you these environments for free. So when you sign up for OpenShift.io, we give these environments for free. They're courtesy of our, uh, of our good friends in the OpenShift Online team at, at Red Hat. 
Um, as such, being that they're free environments, they're really not production quality. Like, there's no SLA with these. There's no guarantee that these apps will be running 24-7. Matter of fact, I pretty much guarantee you they will not be running 24-7. But the idea here is to get all developers used to the experience of deploying to a staging environment, to do UAT in that environment, and then what does it mean to do a promotion or not, you know, to abort the, the operation to this kind of secondary environment. And, you know, if you want to be like, if you're asking, well, how does this all tie in with real production environments, once again, come to our roadmap session tomorrow. So let me go ahead and um, open the app, the web-based app, if I can click correctly. And so here it is. So it's called Sentiment Measure. Um, and if I just say measure, it's going to start measuring OpenShift IO. So what is it doing? It is now saying, it is communicating to Twitter and is requesting of Twitter a real-time feed of tweets that are mentioning OpenShift IO, which apparently no one is right now, so that's kind of sad for me. Um, but it, what it's going to do is it's going to take those tweets in and, and start analyzing them. So I'll, do, I'll type in dogs. Let's see what happens. So it takes a second for the reactive programming to work, but now it's getting in real live tweets from Twitter. Um, I have tried to filter these with some logic, to, so hopefully nothing too horrible shows up there, but anyway. Um, and every time a tweet comes in, it takes that tweet, sends it off to another service running in Azure Machine Learning, which does a sentiment analysis on it and tries to decide, is that tweet a positive tweet? Is it a negative tweet or is it a neutral tweet? And that's the red, greens, and blues you see there, or if, if you have a uh, colorblind issue, there's uh, some emoticons as well to kind of talk about red, green, and blue. So that's what we were asked to build with the app, right? And, I mean, it looks good. I mean, I, I'm seeing something there, but uh, the problem is it's kind of hard to tell what is this sentiment. It's, it seems a bit chaotic, right? I'm seeing, like, some greens, some blues, some reds. And, and I'm, I'm really not sure what the overall sentiment is. So th the first experience was good, but, but not great. Um, if I come back to my plan, and I say go down to look at a, a particular iteration. Um, I think I clicked it wrong. There we go. Uh, so here's like uh, the, all the work that we're doing in the, the current iteration. And some of this work is assigned to me. Some of it's not. Um, well, since we're on kind of a low resolution due to the fact that we're on a projector, but I can see like things are, some things are in progress, some things are not, they're, they're assigned to different people, some things are assigned to multiple people, so on and so forth. This is great if you're kind of doing like a daily stand-up or something like that, but I want to be able to get things done quickly. Todd, you said it was going to help me get it done quickly. So let me go back to analyze, because one of the nice things about going back here is I do get a view of the world that is much more focused on the things I care about and are relevant to me, and one of the things I see here is there is um, a, an experience that's assigned to me that says, hey, the original web app experience focused on displaying the individual sentiment of a stream of tweets. However, this has proven to be somewhat chaotic, as I mentioned, and it's hard to tell what the overall sentiment is. So augment the web app with a metered display that's kind of showing the current sentiment trend. So kind of do a moving average on sentiment and do some graphical thing to, to realize that. So I'm like, great, let's, let's, we can do that. Um, so what I can do here is I could say, you know, take this thing to take, create a meter and wire it up. I can put that in progress because I'm working on it. Um, there was a, another one in there. Now, some of you, who, if you've been on the OpenShift.io journey with us for a while, may be like, wait a minute, Todd, what are you, what are you doing? Why did you open up that, that item and kind of change it to in progress. You used to show us this cool like Kanban board where you just dragged the things around. Where, where did that go? Well, remember I talked about the fact that we have experimental features and beta features and production features. And as we reworked and retooled the planning experience to make it much richer, and as you can see, we have a fairly rich um, hierarchical experience in the planner, the board view that we had sort of became, I wouldn't call it a failed experiment, but it was an experiment that did not succeed. It, it became kind of incompatible with our world. But it was marked as experimental. And experimental features, as I mentioned, sometimes go away. They don't necessarily graduate to being um, uh, beta. Now, that being said, uh, we will have a board view. You will see it return very, very soon, probably within the next few weeks. 
Uh, it'll come back as, a, and as an experiment initially, because that's how we generally do our first release of anything like that. But I'm very confident that this new board view will graduate to beta relatively quickly, and then will likely be uh, released as a production uh, task board, um, probably, say, during this summer, if, if not sooner. Uh, so, so we will lament the, the board for a moment, but it is coming back, and it's going to be better than ever. Great. I've got some work assigned to me now, so let's do some coding. Why not? So when I go over to my code bases, so once again, this is that code that's on GitHub, you'll notice it says workspaces, and I can open one. And this is where I hope I set things up correctly. We'll see. <laughs> and now I'm going into Eclipse Che. So I, once again, I've not left my browser yet. I have not installed anything on my computer. You know, I'm, I'm living like a, just this free wheel and lifestyle. And now I'm in a complete development environment in the cloud. Now, I want to stress something here because it's so important. And a lot of people miss this fact. They feel like people say, oh, web-based IDE, uh, those don't work. I, can't, I, can't, I could never use one of those. No, what you can't use is a web-based code editor. Like if you go to GitHub and you click on a file, you can edit it. But that's all you're doing is you're editing a file. When you use an IDE on your desktop, you debug your code. You run unit tests. You, you, you exercise that application. It runs. If you're in a web-based code editor, you don't have a place for your app to run. Eclipse Che is powered by Eclipse Workspaces. An Eclipse Workspace is a place in the cloud, a containerized environment running in the cloud where your code lives and breathes. And here's where it gets really, really cool. When I used that app wizard and I chose my mission and I chose my runtime, that information wasn't unknown to OpenShift.io and it's not unknown to Eclipse Che. Quite the opposite. So not only has a workspace been created for me, that workspace is fully realized with all the runtime components I need for this app to work. Um, so for those of you that kind of like to see, like, is it a, oops, let me make sure I'm in the right place. So, like, there's a, there's a terminal window, uh, and so I, I can, you know, woo, we can run top, right? Great. Um, you, you could also run Vi here if you chose to use Vi as your editor. I don't know why you'd do that, but you, you could. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, the, the full experience, like, you can do, uh, you know, Maven compiles in there, and that's where we get to see the joy of Maven downloading the Internet, which is always a joy. Um, but so, you know, you get these kind of the full command line experience in the cloud if you like doing command lines. And if I can do a Maven test, so there's unit tests in here, they're running. But the point being there is I have a fully realized environment. But of course, you got more of the traditional IDE things. Like, all right, I don't want to use command line, Todd. I, I use the IDE because I like buttons and graphics and things. So here I am in my IDE. I'm just going to do a quick check just to make sure uh, everything is kosher. And I can do things like run my application. So I'll go ahead and do a quick run. And so now it's running this in my own private little workspace in the cloud. There's uh, some messaging. And let me go ahead and click this preview URL. And if all is well, it takes a second for the app to start running and set up its route in OpenShift. And there it is. So now here's the app running inside of Eclipse Che, not the one that I showed you that was running in my quasi-production environment. So because I have this app running, let me go ahead and just stop for a second. I can come in here, and of course, I can start coding. And you can do the kinds of things you would expect you can do. Like you, whoop, well, that's unfortunate. We hit our first bug of the day. Uh, so normally, I would be able to get code completion, and it would, oh, there it goes. Oh, wow, so just try twice. Um, so here I get code completion, so I've got this router object here. Here are all the methods available on it. And notice I'm also getting the Java doc in line as well. So a very rich, complete um, experience. And this is why um, we have, we kind of focus on Java first. So it's not that you couldn't edit JavaScript in here or you couldn't edit .NET code, but we want you to be able to have that rich of an experience with code completion, refactoring, and all that. So as we bring languages in, we, we want all of that to be there. Um, there's, of course, a full debugger in here. I'm more of a printf type uh, uh, debugger myself, so I have a lot of printfs in here. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a fully realized um, application. So let's go ahead and make that change. Um, 
and I'm just barely on time. So in the make things go a little bit faster, I cheated ever so slightly. And I uh, have the solution to the work I'm supposed to be doing just in a comment. So I'll just uncomment that. And now let's go ahead and rerun this application. And let's do a little hard refresh. Well, the route gets set up in OpenShift, so the application is live. A couple more of these. There it is. All right, now it has the meter. Um, so if the meter was working well, and we came in here, let's say, let's, let's, let's look for tweets that mention love, right? And hopefully, if the world hasn't gone completely cynical, ah, the sentiment is trending positive. So you see the meter is going positive. So that's great. Now, on the con, you know, we could, we could say hate. You know, this is where I hope my filtering of naughty words is going to work well, but well, I guess we'll see. So it takes a second for uh, the new data stream to come in from uh, Twitter, but if it does, I believe we will see the love slowly turn to hate. There's still a lot of love coming in. There's a lot of love in the world out there. Uh, but uh, hopefully that will start uh, going red. Um, all right. Anyway, I think you get the point. Uh, so that, once again, taking from Twitter, going out to Azure Machine Learning, doing the uh, sentiment analysis, and then rendering that inside of my browser. All of that being done with Vertex and in a Vertex event bus. So it's a way of passing messages around that is, that is a, a common model, whether I'm on the client or on the server, which is just a beautiful way for sending data. Oh, here comes the hate. See, there's the hate, right? So it is, it is working, and now just... Uh, so there's no HR violations. I will go and quickly close that. All right. Uh, w one last thing I'm going to do. Um, I'm just going to stop the app from running real quick. Um, I'm going to go look at my POM file. So for those of you that aren't necessarily Java developers, um, my POM file, these are the, the dependencies that I've pulled in my application. Because in a world of open source, you're like, oh, I want to add Twitter to my thing, or I want to add X, I want to add Y. And you just search, and there's like a million choices, right? And, and I want you to be able to make decisions with confidence. That's what OpenShift.io is about. And when you just randomly pick up a package, it's good, is it bad? I don't know, it could be. Somebody said it was good. I, I'm gonna, I'm, I guess I'll you know, roll the dice. Uh, so let's say somebody recommended to me, maybe Brad over here said, hey, you, know, you really should try this web app runner. You know, you should, your app will be much better with that for whatever reason, right? So I add this dependency for this, uh, this web app runner that I'm getting from Maven Central. And b you'll notice almost immediately, like there was almost no pause there when I uncommented that. I've got like the red squiggly and like, like a compiler warning. OpenShift.io is telling me, hey, Todd, there is a security vulnerability in that package. I have been formed before I've even committed any code, I've been protected, I've been saved from doing a horrific act. And that is awesome. So powerful to have that at this level. But I'm a developer, so I'm like, screw it, I'm gonna commit this code anyway. So let me go ahead and do my git commit. And we'll say, uh, we're gonna include all of these files. And I'm gonna say, uh, throw Throw caution to the wind is my commit comment. And I'm even going to push it all the way up to my GitHub repo. So I've done that commit, which is my local rep uh, uh, Git repository in Che, and it also pushed out to my GitHub repository. Now you might expect that continuous integration is going to kick in. And sure enough, it has already started building the code. So a build has started. Now this build is going to build the application. It's going to do uh, some analysis on it, and it's going to create a Maven images. It's going to create, you know, essentially container images, and it's going to deploy it out to my staging environment for me to do user acceptance testing on it. Uh, that'll take about four to five minutes. So rather than wait for that, you know, if I show you it running in the staging environment, it's going to look just the same as it did running in Che. But what I love about that, though, is and why this is fundamentally so important. What that means is 
I'm not constrained by, well, it worked like on my desktop. Like this is the new version of it worked on my desktop. I'm immediately getting the experience of it running in a production-like environment and ensuring there wasn't some configuration difference there, right? which is entirely possible. Even in the Che world, you might have a slight configuration difference between your local workspace and where it gets deployed to. I want to know right away if I've done anything that has violated that. But since I've, I've uh, in the process of um, doing, uh, rehearsing this, I have put that bad dependency, I've committed it before, just to make sure everything's working. So you'll notice on one of my prior runs, it said, hey, there were uh, security vulnerabilities present. So even though I kind of threw caution to the wind, I can't hide from OpenShift.io. It's telling me, hey, inside of that particular build, there was bad stuff. How does it do that? It does it through something called OpenShift.io's stack analytics. Stack analytics look at your code and analyze it. It uses machine learning, it uses big data, it uses a lot of smart people. Sri Krishna can probably explain it much better than I can. He's the, uh, the lead on this stuff. But it is amazing stuff. So CVEs are present. That's worth knowing, right? That's important. But let's go look at this stack report. Because I think this is fundamentally amazing. So the first thing you see here is that there are security issues, and it found one, and it's actually given me a rating of how bad this is, and five out of 10 actually sounds bad, because you usually want to be zero out of 10. So it's telling me that there's a security vulnerability. It's giving me precise information on the vulnerability itself. I kind of lost my mouse, there we go. Um, and I can go in and get more details about it. And one of the things I'll see here is, oh, I was using version 7.0.22.3, there is actually a newer version available, and that's probably the easiest way for me to address this problem is to move up to that newer version. But I also see some things like how many contributors it has, are there forks of that code base of GitHub, so on and so forth. But now let's look at some other things that Stack Analytics can tell me. Tell me something about the licenses. When you bring in a dependency in your application, you've brought with it the license of that dependency. Oh, by the way, you've brought in the licenses of all of the dependencies that it brought in, and so on, and so on. And if you've done any work with Node.js, and you're like, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could just, you know, write align some text? <laughs> and the next thing you know, you've brought in like 9,000 dependencies, because Node.js is insane with that. So how do you know that one of those packages that was a sub, 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 sub dependency doesn't include a license that you don't like, maybe it includes a restrictive license, or worse, has no license at all, or maybe it has a, its own license that isn't like a standard uh, uh, open source standard license. This tells me that I have none of those problems. I have no conflicting licenses. I have no unknown licenses, no restrictive licenses. Moreover, it says, hey, Todd, by the way, now to put the app that you've put together, given the, the different licensing that's available in it, the best license that you could use, the, rec or the suggestion here is, you should use an Eclipse public license version 1.0. So it's even giving me a recommendation of what license I should use now for my application that includes all of these dependencies. That's awesome. Insights. This, I think, is where things are getting freaky, freaky cool. Here, it's now giving me some insights about my application and some things that I've done. So I mentioned that it talks to Twitter with a real-time Twitter feed. And then I use that because I found this thing called twitter for j which was a really nice uh, package I found on Maven Central that made it super easy for me to tie in a real-time uh, uh, feed from, from uh, Twitter and handled all the streaming of the data and things like that. So I love that. But what um, OpenShift.io is telling me is, hey, you know, that, uh, what you've done is a little unusual. You've built a vertex, uh, Eclipse vertex application that uses configuration maps, is built for OpenShift, has a bunch of dependencies in it, and you're also using Twitter for J, and quite frankly, we don't see a lot of other people using that combination of stuff. It's not telling me I've made a mistake, but it's just letting me know I'm doing something that's a bit of an outlier. But it gives me some information about Twitter for J. I can see that I'm on the latest version, um, that there's 30 contributors, there's a th over 1,000 forks of it, it's in 2,500 uh, repos on GitHub itself. Um, it's got over 2,000 stars. And in OpenShift.io's view of the world is there's about 10 
uh, OpenShift.io visible things using this. Because OpenShift.io and Stack Analytics get smarter the more you use it. Because it's going to say, all right, you've done this, Todd. I'm warning you that it's a little bit of an outlier. But it will also see, hey, but Todd's been successful. He's done multiple builds. His app's been running. It, it's not crashing. There's a world of information that OpenShift.io can see about my application that can allow it to evolve its understanding of the safety, the relative safety of this package with the other uh, dependencies I had. Take this further. Other people might now be like, oh, it's, I should use Twitter for J. I should use Twitter for J. Go a, a year out. Somebody might start writing a Vertex application that they want to bring in Twitter data, and maybe they find some other Twitter package, and they start using that. OpenShift.io will then tell that person, hey, you're using this other Twitter package. We don't know that there's anything necessarily wrong with it. However, when people are building applications that look like your application, the vast majority of them use Twitter for J, so you might want to consider changing from your, the Twitter package you chose to Twitter for J. I find that to be incredibly powerful. That is expert knowledge being given to me as uh, given to every developer right, 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 um, right in their browser. And one last thing that I, I, I forgot to mention, um, this, this dependency, this, this, this critical vulnerability that was in the code, I, I should have pointed it out, I can log a bug. And when I, I just click that, and a bug has now been added to my product backlog to go address this security vulnerability. Because even though I see in this report, I might not fix it this very second. Now I know to go fix it. All right. I don't know how, but I managed to do the entire demo in the time allotted, which is actually the first time after 19 attempts to do so. Uh, so I will pause there briefly and ask if there are any questions, please. And will there be an on-prem version of OpenShift.io? So there's a number of sessions I might recommend you go see about this. Um, I, I will describe it to you this way, uh, two things. First of all is OpenShift.io, the thing that's called that is an online service, right? And as such, it's always going to be an online service. Now, the technologies that comprise it will absolutely make their way into on-premise projects. The, Probably the, the one part that people are always interested in is, can I run Eclipse Che on OpenShift on-prem? And Brad, did you, can we say? So we're, we, we have now committed that we will have a supported version of Eclipse Che from Red Hat that you can run on-prem on OpenShift coming sometime in the not too distant future. That is, that is definitely on the, the roadmap. Ah, so the question is, was this Black Duck that's doing the licensing checks and all that? No, this is all Red Hat author technology. Um, one of the things we actually want to do is we want to make it so that third parties like Black Duck can integrate in here and offer a premium offering. You know, so if you already have a subscription with them, you want to get them that in here. Absolutely, those, we've had conversations with Black Duck and others uh, specifically on things like that.